Hi, welcome to AWS Innovate 2018 Developer Edition. Thank you so much for joining the Amazon Game Tech Track. My name is Brent Nash. I'm a senior software developer at Amazon Game Studios, and I build out a lot of our backend services. Uh, and I build them out for our games using AWS. So I've built things like matchmaking and build and deployment, crash reporting, and especially analytics. And so today we're going to talk about how to use AWS services to build out an analytics architecture that will let you capture information about your game and about your players with the goal of increasing player engagement and ultimately making a better game. And so this is the overview of what we're going to cover today. So we're going to start with talking about analytics for games, why they matter, why they're important for game development. We'll talk about a little bit, a little bit of the AWS background, the benefits of building in AWS and introduce some of the key services we're going to use. We'll spend most of the presentation talking through the architecture from how we produce data all the way up through how we analyze it. And we'll spend a little bit of time talking about the evolution of the architecture, how we can change it over time as our game changes. And then we'll conclude with some takeaways that hopefully you can take from here and use in your day-to-day. -day. And so with that, let's jump into the analytics portion. So when it comes to analytics in games, it's important to be able to actually collect information from your game and use that to learn about your players. So the basic flow we want to cover is something like this. We're going to measure what players are doing from our game. We're going to use that information to understand our game design, our game balance, and ultimately our player experience. And we want to use that information to improve our game. And some reasons you might want to do that are to increase engagement, keep your players happy, increase retention, keep them coming back, ultimately increase monetization and drive revenue for your game. And the key here is we want to be data driven about it. You don't want to have to trust your gut. Because whether you know it or not, when you design these features and interfaces in your games, you have these inherent biases. You expect players to behave one way. But when you collect data, the data often tells a different story. And this could be as simple as determining what control scheme your players use. Do they prefer controller or mouse and keyboard? Could be what character they're picking, what items they're buying. At the end of the day, if you don't have actual data on this stuff, you're really just guessing. And as a game developer, you only have so much time and effort you can put in, so you want to make sure you're focusing on the right things. Having done this a number of times over the years, I find this kind of works best as the scientific method. And what I mean by that is you want to start with questions. So don't indiscriminately collect data just because it seems like a good idea. Start with an idea of what you want to know. So maybe you want to know what character gets picked the most, or maybe you want to know what the hardest level in your game is. And then form your hypothesis, and then instrument data that you need to answer that question. And you want to collect that data, analyze it, and ultimately use it to draw a conclusion, see if you do need to make changes. And inevitably, this is going to create this flywheel effect where, as you draw conclusions, you're inevitably going to come back to the top and generate more questions and, and continue along. So I find analytics works best with an example. And so I'd like to start off talking about level design in games. So the map on your screen is from a four, four player, sorry, an eight player four versus four online multiplayer game prototype that I worked on. And the idea is that we have two teams of four. They start at each end of the arena and we'll spawn an objective we call the relic in the center of the arena. And the goal here is for each team of four to get the relic and take it to the opponent's base. And there are combat elements to this game. There are these platforming paths around the outside where players can traverse more quickly but potentially fall off the edge. And when you look at the map, you can see what our level designers had in mind. So they were trying to encourage specific player behavior. There's this big open area in the center of the map where we're trying to funnel combat. There are these unprotected, high-risk, high-reward platforming paths around the outside where players might fall off the map. And we wanted to figure out if this level was behaving as expected. And so the question we wanted to answer was, where are player deaths occurring in this map? A very common way to, to visualize these types of things in games is to create what's called a heat map. So many of you have probably seen a heat map before, but let's walk through how you might create one. So the first thing you do is take a beautiful image of your level like this, Apologize profusely to your art team because you have to turn it into something like this. We want a top-down, two-dimensional screenshot with all the visual noise removed. Then from there, we can create a gradient. We'll say anywhere there are cooler colors like blacks and yellows, that's going to be where fewer player deaths happen. Anywhere there are warmer colors like yellows and whites, that will be where more player death happened. And then you plot it. And when you plot it, it looks pretty interesting, but if you're not intimately familiar with the game level, it might not be immediately clear what's happening. Let's look at them side by side to sort of see. So the first thing you might notice about this map, if you were me, is that the data looks horribly broken. There are data points off the edge of the map everywhere. 
it seems like maybe our data was malformed. And it turns out that's actually totally accurate because those black dots off the top and bottom of the map, that's players jumping off the map or getting pushed off the map. So that tracks with the platforming. That's good. That's what we expected. And you can look for other patterns as well. So for instance, there's this big warm stripe down the middle of the level. And that must be where all the combat is being funneled like we intended originally. You can look for other patterns as well. So for instance, there are these choke points at the bottom of the stairs on the other side of the map that look like pretty dangerous spots to be for a player when you're in combat. And maybe we expected that, maybe we didn't, so that might be worth looking into as well. You can also look for the absence of data. I happen to know that in this map, there are these buffs that spawn on top of the ziggurats on either side that increase player health, increase player damage, and we expect people to be competing over those pretty heavily. Based on this heat map, it looks like they're not. So that's another area for further investigation. And while this is a PC-specific example that we've done here, there's nothing PC-specific about heat maps. They work on mobile games, they work on console games, and everything else. What I'd like you to do is remember this example, keep it in the back of your mind. As we go through building out this end-to-end -end architecture, our end goal is going to be to generate data that we can use to ultimately create these heat maps. With that, let's talk about some of the AWS background that led us here. When we talk about building on the AWS background, there are two areas we want to cover. So the first is why Amazon Web Services is a great fit for this problem domain. And the second is what are some of the key services that we use to build out this architecture. So there are a lot of advantages to building the AWS cloud. As a developer, the one I enjoy the most is this agility that it gives you. And what that means is that you can move fast, you can innovate quickly, and you can really try experiments. You can spin up new services and tools and experiment with them and spin them back down when you don't need them. And this is very much in contrast to you know, other places I've worked where I've had to order hardware and wait for it to be delivered and wait for an infrastructure team to set it up for me. Being able to take the weeks of effort and turn it into minutes of effort to be able to try out new things is a very powerful thing. And that lends itself directly to cost savings as well because you don't have to make this upfront investment in the cloud. You really pay as you go and you pay for what you use. So only the experiments that hang around and you continue using are the ones you need to keep paying for. Anything you don't want to pay for anymore, you can just spin back down and stop using. And that factors into elasticity as well. And for games, that has a couple meanings. I think what most people associate with elasticity is this ability to spin up enough servers to handle your player demand. So you're not that game whose login servers are inaccessible on launch day. But it also applies to being able to start small in development and scale your architecture up to production without having to re rebuild the whole thing in between. And as a developer, another fun piece is this breadth of functionality. So AWS has been continually expanding now and has more than 125 services available. And that means everything from network to compute to storage to AI and many, many other categories are available to you. So you can really kind of pick and choose the pieces you want to build out this architecture. And finally, there's this ability to deploy globally in minutes. And the idea here is that gaming is global. Ideally, you're gonna have players all around the world. So being able to take your game servers and move them close to your players to reduce latency and improve player experience ends up being a pretty big deal. When you put it all together, it makes a lot of sense why you might build an analytics system on AWS. From there, I want to talk about some of the specific services we used. So we mentioned there are over 125 services available. As much as I would love to cover all of them here, we're going to really just touch on the main four that we used to build this architecture. So the first major service for analytics is the service called Amazon Kinesis Streams. If you're not familiar with Kinesis Data Streams, it's a fully managed service for collecting and processing large streams of data records in real time. For us as developers, what that means is it's a giant buffer. We can take all of these events from our game clients, our game servers, and everywhere else, and send them directly to Kinesis. It can auto-scale to handle the load, and it can also sort of serve as an entry point to our back end for how we ingest data. And once we have all this data ingested, we're ready to store it somewhere. And that's where a service like Amazon S3 comes in. Amazon S3 is a simple storage service. It's highly scalable and reliable. It's got low cost and low latency. And if you have mass amounts of data you need to store in AWS, Amazon S3 is a great place to put it. It also has uh, very nice integrations with a number of other AWS services that once you get data into S3, it opens up a lot of options within AWS for analysis and processing. So once we've got all this data stored in S3, we also want to talk about how we can quickly query it and analyze it. And that's where a service like Amazon Redshift comes in. Amazon Redshift is this fast, fully managed, petabyte scale data warehouse in the cloud. And this is not your standard relational database. This is a data warehouse. It's meant for these giant crunching aggregation queries against all of your player data. And furthermore, it's fully SQL compatible. 
So any tools you have or any developers or analysts you have that know SQL, they'll be comfortable and at home with Redshift. And with all this data storage, now we need to talk about where we're actually going to run our processing logic in our code. In this architecture, we make heavy use of AWS Elastic Beanstalk, which is an easy to use service for deploying and scaling web services. And as a developer, I like it a lot because it has a bunch of different options. So for languages, it supports Java and Go and Python and Ruby. You can use Docker containers. In general, it strikes a nice balance between letting you poke at the underlying stuff if you need to, but abstracting away the complexity if you don't. And if you look back at all these services, they're all elastically scalable. All of our data storage is managed. And what that means is you don't need an entire analytics team to build out an analytics architecture. You can operate and manage this with a very small number of people. So from there, now that we know the services that we want to build on top of, let's talk about the actual architecture. If you've ever seen an analytics presentation before, you've probably seen a flow that looks something like this. First, we'll talk about how we produce data. Then we'll talk about how we ingest it into our backend. Then how we store that data for later processing. And ultimately, how we analyze that data to do things like generate heat maps. This flow is fine as it is, but in reality, it really looks more something like this. Just like our scientific method, Inevitably, as you analyze data, you're going to generate more questions and produce more data as a result. To start, we're going to talk about data production. And I think this is really the underappreciated part of analytics, because you can have the greatest analytics backend in the world, but if you put data in, you're going to get bad analysis back out. There's no salvaging bad data. So you want to put some thought in up front to make sure that what you're sending your system is going to ultimately generate the analysis you want. To start off, let's look at what the things we actually send out of the game might look like. Many games that I've worked on use a model that we call event-based telemetry. And the idea of event-based telemetry is we're going to send these unique point-in-time events to our backend. Events can be a lot of different things. They can be gameplay things like a player collected an item, a player completed a level. They can also be non-gameplay things like a, a player launched your game client, a game server crashed, or a frame rate measurement. These are all valid events we can send. So the four main features of events is that they're unique, they have a unique identifier, they occur at a point in time, which means they have a timestamp, and they're self-describing. What that means is, well, player death is a useful event. Player death for player X, killed by player Y, at this timestamp, in this level, at this X, Y coordinate. The more information we add to these events, the more useful they become. Finally, I think it's okay for your events to be redundant. If you send two events that overlap information a little bit, it can actually be a good thing, because while you'll use a little more bandwidth up front, it can save you some analysis later. So for instance, if you have a game with combat, maybe you might send an event every time a player gets a kill. But at the same time, you might also send an event every time there's a player death. And in the case where one player kills another player, sure, those events overlap completely. You could probably figure out one from the other. But if you send them separately, they can actually make some of your queries a lot easier. For instance, if you're doing things like calculating kill-death assist ratios for all your players. And so ultimately, don't be afraid of little redundancy in your events. Now that we know what events are, let's take a look at what these events actually look like at sort of the message level. So this is a sample event we might be able to use to generate those heat maps we talked about earlier. So don't worry about reading the whole thing yet. We'll go through it. But at a high level, you'll notice I chose JSON as the default format here. And I feel like that's most people's go-to, but if you wanted to use something like XML or a binary format or anything else, those are perfectly valid as well. The one consideration is that a lot of the native tools and services in AWS support JSON natively. And so you'll get a lot of sort of free benefit and free features out of the box by using a JSON format. And with that, let's walk through the event. So first of all, we have this event section at the top. We have an event version. We'll version all of our events. So if we need to change this format later, it won't be painful. Secondly, we have this event ID, this unique identifier we'll give to every event, and that can be useful later for deduplicating events and things like that. We have an event timestamp, which is the point in time in Unix epic milliseconds that the event occurred, and an event type, in this case a player death. In addition, there's probably some higher level information you want to know too. So for instance, you probably want to know what game this event came from and what version of the game. You also want some sort of unique identifier for the player who caused this event to be generated. And you'll notice here we've just used a standard kind of anonymous UUID. When defining this, you should think really hard about whether or not you actually need personally identifying information about your players. Odds are you probably don't. You can generate an anon anonymous identifier 
and reuse it and get most of the same benefits you get by using anything personally identifying such as a username. A really easy example of how you might generate an ID like this is the first time your player launches your game, generate a unique identifier, maybe a version 4 UUID or something similar, and write it off to AppData or temporary storage. The next time the user launches the game, read out that ID you wrote previously and just reuse it. And with that, you can have this nice anonymous ID that still gives you the ability to calculate your daily active users and all the other things you care about. And finally, if you're going to generate heat maps, you probably need some information about the level. So what level this event occurred in and what the XY position in that level was. From there, let's look at the 10,000 foot view of the analytics system and how we're actually sending these events. So we have our analytic system up at the top and we'll get to that in a minute. But let's pretend we have a session-based multiplayer game. We have game clients on their PCs all around the world and game servers running in something like, like Amazon EC2. Players get together on a server, play a match, and then leave. Now, I'm not going to dig too deeply into Amazon game servers here, but if you're interested in how to run your game servers on AWS, I recommend you check out the talk right after this one in the track by Peter Chapman, who will talk about choosing the right game server solution for your project. But for us, I really want to dig into more what these game clients and game servers are sending from an analytics standpoint. Let's talk about game servers first. So if you're making a multiplayer game, odds are that most of your game is probably server authoritative on the game server side. And that's to keep people from cheating. If your game logic is on the server, game clients can't manipulate it. So most of your gameplay events will probably come from your server. In addition, anything like memory usage, CPU usage, or anything else, those can come from your game server as well. And game servers are nice to work with in analytics because they're mostly trusted. And what we mean by that is we don't expect them to do anything intentionally malicious. Now that being said, intentionally malicious or trusted is not the same as will not do bad things. So if you're anything like me, you will send yourself horribly malformed data, you will accidentally instrument events that trigger every simulation frame and flood your backend. These things will absolutely happen, but at least it's in a trusted environment you control and you can fix easily. That's in contrast to game clients. Game clients tend to send a lot less of the data, about 5% in my overall experience, but they send some pretty important stuff. Game clients tend to be your main source of engagement data. When did people launch your game? How long did they play? They're obviously the main source of client performance information, like frame rate measurements. And many games have offline game modes. So for instance, you might have an offline tutorial players play before they ever connect to a game server. You'll probably want that data as well. The difference between clients and servers is that clients are untrusted. And that means a couple things. Certainly, we could be talking about people trying to hack your game and exploit things. They'll pull your keys out of memory. They'll send junk to your backend. That absolutely happens. But from an analytics standpoint, the thing that tends to actually happen quite a bit more often is you have well-meaning people who love to play your game. There's just something weird about their system. For instance, maybe they have their system clock set to two weeks ago, and everything they send you looks like it's coming out of a time warp. And what that means is you don't want to inherently trust anything that comes from these untrusted sources like clients. You want to make sure you validate that data before you let it into your backend. You might consider setting up some kind of proxy that clients talk through before the data enters your analytics pipeline. As long as you're validating that untrusted data, you'll be fine. And with that, we've got the first part of our architecture. We've got these game clients and game servers sending events. Now we're ready to talk about how we can ingest that information into the backend. And when you talk about an ingestion endpoint, there are a lot of things that matter, but there's really a couple major ones. The first is that we want something elastically scalable. And the second is that we want something that will decouple our data producers from the rest of our backend. And so the service for us that made the most sense for doing that was Amazon Kinesis Data Streams. Kinesis Streams is this fully managed service for collecting and processing large streams of data records in real time. It's elastically scalable, it decouples data producers from data consumers, and it has a retention window of anywhere from a day to a week, depending on how you want to configure it. So once data gets into Kinesis, it's there durably and able to be replayed out very easily. Furthermore, Kinesis is fully managed. What that means is you don't have to worry about all the underlying server infrastructure. When you provision a Kinesis stream and look inside, you provision it in terms of shards. Shards are your unit of scaling in Amazon Kinesis. Every shard provides one, mega, one megabyte per second of write capacity and two megabytes per second of read capacity. And that's all you need to worry about. But I want to get back to this decoupling idea because I actually think that's the core superpower of Amazon Kinesis data streams. Because these game clients and game servers publishing events, they don't need to know who's processing them. They could be getting published by some legacy application running on a server under my desk. Or maybe they're getting read by some giant Apache Spark cluster running in Amazon Elastic MapReduce. 
Or maybe there's some ridiculous service that prints out every single event on a piece of paper, folds it into a paper airplane, and throws it out the window. The point is, these clients and servers, they don't need to know. And furthermore, that's important because all three of those things could be happening. Amazon Kinesis provides the ability to send a single event in and fan it out to multiple data consumers. So that covers data consumers not knowing about data producers, but it goes the other way as well. Because for these consumer pipelines, these events could really be coming from anywhere. They could be coming from a single application on a single host, or they could be coming from the same application across multiple hosts. Or they could be coming from many different applications, like clients and servers and other things, across a whole set of machines. The point is, it does not matter. And the more consumers and producers can avoid each other and avoid knowing about each other, the better off your architecture will be. Because what that means is we can change one side or change the other without having to sort of worry about concurrently changing things and concurrently deploying new fixes. It'll, this decoupling will give us a great ability to modify our architecture over time. And so with that, we're back. We've got these clients and servers sending events. We buffer them up in Amazon Kinesis to ingest into our backend. Now we're ready to talk about how we're actually going to store this data and use it. And when you talk about data storage, data storage is really about your requirements. Because what you'll probably find, like we found, is that you'll actually want to use your data a bunch of different ways. In analytics, a common way to deal with data is to qualify it by temperature. So the first type of data we care about for our architecture is what I would call cold data. The idea of cold data is that we're going to take every event that comes into the system and hold on to it, uh, hold on to it for a potentially long time, maybe on the order of years. The trade-off there is that we're OK if the access to it is slow. And the turnaround time from when it gets into the system till we can get it back out, not a big deal. As long as it gets there and gets stored durably, that's fine. Furthermore, it's OK for the data to be semi-structured. So we can leave it in its original JSON format when we're storing it here. And the AWS service that made the most sense in this scenario was Amazon S3. As you recall from earlier, S3 is this simple storage service. It's fully managed, elastically scalable. It's a great place for long-lived data. For analytics, it's got some other nice features. It's got these lifecycle rules that you can use to expire data to cheaper storage over time. Maybe you might take all data that's over six months old and push it to something like Amazon Glacier. In addition, it integrates really well with a number of other AWS services, from machine learning to Elastic MapReduce and many others. Now that we know we want to use Amazon S3, let's look one layer deeper at how we can actually use it for this scenario. S3 has the logical concept of buckets. So we're going to take all of our telemetry events, buffer them up into files, and write them to an S3 bucket. And the idea is that we're going to take every event that comes into the system and generate these large events JSON files. We're going to take one event per line in those files. And we'll generate what we consider a big enough file. In our case, it was around 100 megabytes for efficiency of cost and processing. And we'll push that up to S3 to be stored. And when you index things in S3, you store them by a key. So if you look at the bottom of the slide, you can see we're using sort of this time series key structure. We store them under this year, month, day, hour mapping. So when somebody comes back and says, they need all the data from Q3 of 2017, we can easily go find it and look it up. And with that, let's talk about how we can fit this back into our architecture. So we've got all of our events in this Amazon Kinesis stream. We want to get them into Amazon S3. This is where AWS Elastic Beanstalk comes in. So we'll make this AWS Elastic Beanstalk application. We call it the S3 app in the diagram. It's going to read events from Kinesis, buffer them up in memory, and when it has enough, it'll generate one of these event files and write it up in a batch to Amazon S3. And we can use that S3 app to do validation, to do processing, maybe enrich data by adding new things like a server-side timestamp. So we can deal with all those people whose timestamps from two weeks ago look like a time warp. A server-side processing timestamp that's reliable can be very helpful in that situation. And if all you wanted was cold data storage, this is a great starting architecture. And you can use services like Amazon Athena to execute pay-as-you-go SQL queries directly against Amazon S3. So to start, cold data storage is a great thing. But what you might find, like we found, is that there are other categories of data you care about. So in addition to cold data, we found out that we also cared about another category we call warm data. And the idea of warm data is that most recent is most relevant. So if you think about how your game might change over time, how you make gameplay balance changes, how you change and add levels and things like that, older gameplay data becomes irrelevant pretty quickly. So we want to hold on to the last six months of data. The trade-off, though, is that we want fast access to it. 
The turnaround time from when it gets into the system till we can get it back out, that needs to be less than an hour. And furthermore, we want well-structured data. So we want strong data types that we know that we can query against. The service that made the most sense for doing this for us was Amazon Redshift. If you recall, Amazon Redshift is this fast, fully managed petabyte scale data warehouse. So it's fully managed. We don't have to know what's happening under the covers. It's scalable, so we can grow it over time. And it's fully SQL compatible. So our tools that know SQL, our developers and analysts who are comfortable with SQL, they will all work just fine with Redshift. So let's head back to the architecture. We've got our cold data pipeline. We've got data flowing into S3. Now we want this warm data to get in Amazon Redshift. And how can we make that happen? With the breadth of functionality in AWS, there's a bunch of different ways you could do this. But for our scenario, the thing that made the most sense was creating a secondary Kinesis stream. We call this the file stream. And the idea is that our first stream is all the raw events we've received from our producers. The second stream is a stream of S3 file pointers. So every time our S3 app receives new, new events and publishes a batch to S3, we'll take the bucket name and the S3 key and we'll publish that downstream. Then we'll have this second AWS Elastic Beanstalk app, we call the Redshift app, that will read those file pointers, buffer them up in memory, and when it has enough, it'll initiate a copy to Amazon Redshift. And you might notice that multiple arrows jumped on the diagram at the same time there. And that's because Redshift has this built-in copy command that can read data directly from Amazon data sources like S3. You execute the copy command over your standard JDBC, ODBC, or whatever database connection that you have, and Redshift will copy data massively in parallel directly from S3 into your tables in Redshift. When you need to get mass amounts of data into Amazon Redshift, that's a great way to do it. With that, we're back to our architecture. We've got our events coming out of clients and servers, we've got data ingested in Kinesis, and we're storing cold data in S3 and warm data in Redshift. Now we're ready to talk about how we can analyze that data. And when you talk about data an analysis for games, there are a bunch of different types of things you can do from business to performance to gameplay. For our purposes, I want to bring it back to where we started. I want to talk about heat maps. Because when I first went to generate these heat maps for our game, I was worried it was going to be an incredibly difficult problem. And I, maybe as the sole developer, I wasn't going to be able to make it happen myself. But it turns out with the power of AWS and with a lot of the open source data science tools out there, heat maps actually aren't that bad. So advanced warning. This was AWS Innovate 2018 Developer Edition. I'm a programmer. You knew there was going to be code on the slide at some point. So this is 80% of a Python script I wrote to generate those heat maps you saw previously. And what's nice about this is that it didn't take me you know, weeks and months to figure out. I was able to figure this out pretty quickly. So let's kind of walk through what's happening here. The first thing is that if you're going to query data out of a database, you probably need a database connection. So I'm a big fan of the Python library PG8000. It's Redshift compatible, and it's a pure Python library, which means it runs anywhere. Now let us point to the elephant in the room here, which is that I have hard-coded a username and password onto this slide. Let us all agree as developers that hard-coding credentials is a horrible idea. And the only time you should ever do it is when you're trying to fit data on a PowerPoint slide. If you're going to work with Amazon Redshift, I recommend you look at the Get Cluster Credentials API. It's this interesting API where you have the ability to take your standard AWS IAM credentials and use them to generate time-limited, uh, secure credentials, usernames, and passwords to work with Amazon Redshift, which is a much better security approach in this situation. Once we've got our database connection, we're ready to actually run a query. If you look at the query we have here, it's actually pretty short, and this is really all it took. Let's start with the where clause. You can see that we're asking Redshift for all of the player death events, and we're asking for them in a specific level. If we move up to the select clause, you can see that we're trying to query out X position, Y position, and get a count. And logically, what we're actually doing here is we're dividing our level map into one meter by one meter squares, and then counting up how many player deaths occurred in each one. Once we've got that data, here's the part I get to hand wave at a bit, because it's game specific. If you're collecting this information out of your levels, odds are that your X, Y coordinates, those are in game world space, which is great, but when you need to map them onto a heat map, you actually need them in image pixel space instead. So there needs to be some conversion done here. The good news is that if you're a game developer, either you or somebody you know is probably pretty good at coordinate transformations. So you'll probably make pretty quick work of this problem. Once you've got that data converted, you're ready to generate the heat map. And this is really where the magic happens. So we're leveraging the open source Python library pandas to sort of do all this data generation for us, or this visualization generation. So on the first line there, we're going to create a data frame, which is pandas sort of built-in native data type. 
And on the second line, we're going to call this hex bin function. We're going to give it the data frame. We're going to say how big we want the hexes to be, how much alpha transparency they should have, get rid of the borders between them. And that command will essentially generate that entire heat map visualization for us. The last step is to overlay it on top of our level image. So we take our heat map, we take our level screenshot, and we use the Z order to lay one on top of the other. And with that, we've got a complete heat map. And, and the takeaway here, I think, is that I thought this would be a tough problem. It really wasn't with the data and the format we had and with the tools available. And you can extrapolate this out to lots of other types of analyses that might seem complicated, but are actually pretty straightforward when you have the right tool set. With that, we've got our entire architecture. Clients and servers publishing events, Kinesis ingesting into the back end, cold data in S3, warm data in Redshift, and you'll notice we have our heat map tool over on the side there. We also make use of a lot of ad hoc SQL queries by developers and by analysts. And we leverage Tableau from the AWS Marketplace to talk directly to Redshift as well. It helps us generate these persistent workbooks that anybody can go check out at any point in time. And with that, we're done. And that was true for a while, but if you've worked in software development and specifically in games, you know that's not entirely true because things change, things evolve. And so I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about the evolution of this architecture and how it changed over time. For us, what happened is that we went from development mode to more production mode. And there came a new category of data that was not cold or warm. It was what we call hot data. And the idea of hot data is that the most recent is the most relevant. This is data that's going to do things like give us critical information about our game operations. It's going to fuel live dashboards. It's going to trigger alarms when things go wrong. So we're only going to hold on to this data for seven days but we still want super fast access to it. And the turnaround time from when it gets into the system till we can get it back out, that's gotta be five minutes or less. Furthermore, it should still be fully structured so we can query against it easily. The AWS service that made the most sense for doing this for us was Amazon Elasticsearch service, which is a service for deploying, operating, and scaling Elasticsearch clusters in the AWS cloud. If you're not familiar with Elasticsearch, I recommend you check it out, but it could probably fill a whole other set of presentations unto itself. At a high level, it's a distributed search and analytics engine. It does neat stuff with time series data like analytics, and it has a bunch of really useful plugins. Like our team grew very attached to the Kibana dashboarding plugin for sort of creating their own custom dashboards. But the real question I want to address here is, we just built an entire architecture. We have all our cold data and warm data. We didn't think about this hot data when we built it. How can we add that in? You know, do we have to redesign and change everything that we just spent all this time on? And it turns out, adding it's actually pretty easy. What we did is we created another Elastic Beanstalk app. We call this one the Elasticsearch app, and it reads events directly from our Kinesis stream, buffers them up in memory, and pushes them in bulk to Amazon Elasticsearch service. And what's great about this pattern is that our game clients and game servers publishing events, they didn't need to know Elasticsearch entered the picture. These cold data and warm data pipelines processing all the events, they didn't need to know there was another consumer pipeline either. This ends up being a very powerful pattern for letting you test out new analytics technologies, and for affording data to other interested systems. So that covers adding new consumer pipelines. I wonder if the same is true of adding new data producers as well. Because if you think about your game as a whole, your clients and servers, they only know part of the picture. So as a for instance, maybe you have a game launcher that does some bootstrapping and login. Maybe you have backend services like matchmaking or achievements. Maybe you have crash reporting. Or maybe you have marketing campaigns you might be able to do ad attribution for your game it would be great if we could get all that useful information into the same place as our game data. And so if we come back to our architecture, we have a similar question. We now have all these new data sources we didn't consider originally. How do we get them to be part of our architecture? And it turns out the answer is, again, pretty straightforward. They can just publish events directly into our stream. Because these game clients and game servers, they don't need to know there's other data producers involved. And these cold data and warm data pipelines, as long as the new events follow the expected schema, they can just publish them like anything else. They don't need to know their new data producers either. And so with that, we've got this sort of nice flex flexible architecture we're able to evolve over time. So let's look at some takeaways and try to tie this all together. Having built these systems a lot on AWS over the years, what I've discovered is that when you do it right, it almost works like magic. You have this ability to innovate and experiment quickly. You can scale things up and down automatically to meet load. And you can really just modify things and evolve things over time very easily. And furthermore, the more systems you build this way, you get this multiplicative value of how they all work and scale together. But there's one thing I wanted to come back to. I think there are a couple of subtle points about this architecture that I want to make sure we point out. 
So let's look at this architecture we built from a pure functionality standpoint. And what I mean by that is let's purely talk about getting events from our clients and servers into Amazon S3 and Amazon Redshift. In order to do that, we don't technically need these Amazon Kinesis streams. We could publish events directly from clients and servers to this S3 app, put an elastic load balancer in front of it, scale it horizontally. The same is true of our other Kinesis stream as well. But the difference here is that although they add an extra moving part to the architecture, they provide some massive benefits. So first of all, they're a great point for durability and disaster recovery. Once data gets into Amazon Kinesis, it's pretty much stored there durably for one to seven days, depending how we configure it. Likewise, they give us this flexibility in decoupling, as we saw, that allows us to add new data producers, add new data consumers easily without having to change everything else. And then finally, they end up being easy buffer points to trigger scaling. So while these streams themselves can scale elastically, our AWS Elastic Beanstalk apps can also watch those streams, watch the data volume, watch how far behind real-time processing they are, and use that to make scaling decisions, whether to scale up or scale down. And then secondly, where we put our data matters. We chose native AWS services that interoperate well together, and we chose data stores with fan out. And what that means is our analytics process is a single process writing in, but we can have multiple consumer flows and tools reading back out of those data stores without affecting our production operations. And we have these data stores that scale easily and scale elastically as well. Anything or anyone that knows SQL can talk directly to Amazon Redshift. Many tools and services support Amazon S3 and the signatures it uses as well. And so, well, to be clear, you want to make sure you're following proper security protocols and not opening your data up to the world, but keeping it locked down to those who should have access. You also want to make sure that you're not sequestering your data away somewhere where nothing else can get to it. There's nothing sadder than having all this great analytics data stored in a system that can't scale beyond one thing reading from it, or has some weird proprietary API that your tools and services and developers can't get to. So think about this fan out when you create your data stores and where you put your data. So with that, let's talk through sort of a, how we tie things back together and what you can take away from this presentation. I think we all agree at this point that you need to be data driven about your game. And data analysis is not just for the big guys. You don't have to be a AAA studio. You don't need a dedicated analytics team. But you need to be data driven and stop guessing. Get actual information about your game and stop trusting your gut. And when you build your architecture, make sure you abstract and decouple wherever possible. Think really hard if system A actually needs to know about system B or if you can decouple them by putting something like a Kinesis stream in between. And when you create your data stores, try to emphasize data stores with fan out, where your system can write events in and multiple trusted sources can read things back out. And embrace the agility of the cloud. So run experiments, be agile, embrace change. The architecture you build initially it doesn't have to be the architecture you use forever. You can use these decoupling principles and this flexibility to chop and change things over time. And finally, what you really want to do is let AWS do the heavy lifting. Because all the time you spend solving solved problems or dealing with infrastructure issues is time you're not spend making your game great and using your data to engage your players better. So with that, thank you so much for attending the session. Uh, I hope you can take some of the lessons, takeaways from this presentation and go build some amazing games. And please stay tuned for Peter Chapman's presentation up next on choosing the right game server solution for your project. Thank you again.